for it. We are live. <laughs> wow. Awesome. All right. Well, folks will start joining here as this gets pushed out to uh, all of Twitter and all of YouTube. Um, but as we kick things off, welcome to a Friday night edition of uh, the Husk Guys podcast. Uh, we are pumped. We've got a very special guest uh, today. Adam, the college football professor McClintock is joining us today. Uh, we are super pumped to have him on. Um, before we get started, quick word from our sponsors as per usual. Uh, we've got Pipeline Jerky folks in the house. For those who are new to the pod, uh, Pipeline Jerky is created by us um, for direction tension of building up that pipeline, building up the Huskers uh, offensive line back. So with every purchase, we're giving a royalty directly back to the offensive line to rebuild the 90s pipeline, which came straight to Adam. So uh, folks, we've had a very special guest. Uh, Adam's joining us on a Friday night. Uh, and Adam is working for Matrix Analytical, one of the super cool companies that's directly right in the center of, of college football hiring, um, of coaches, of athletic directors, of staffs, super interesting company. Uh, we're going to dive into the nuts and bolts of it, how the company started, where it's going, what they're doing, you know, any relation to the college football world that we can. But Adam, before we kick off, thank you for joining us. Uh, welcome to the show. Hey, thanks guys. Thanks for having me on. This is exciting. Yeah. Awesome. And so it, for those to reground everybody, I know this and, and we all know this, but you are originally from Beatrice, correct? Exactly. Yep. From Beatrice, just south of Lincoln. So I am, I am a, a Husker by birth. So <laughs> that's what I'm talking about. Yeah, baby. Husker by birth and, and a fan. A fan? A, a Husker fan? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Season okay. ticket holder. Yeah. I'm, I'm all, all the above. But you've moved above, since. You live, I think you live in uh, somewhere else now, right? Yeah. I live in, I live near, near Tulsa. So okay. I am in enemy territory, but it's, that's okay. I still flag that fly, fly that flag outside my house, and everybody can go by and jeer as they want. But it's, it's still gonna fly. So okay. <laughs> awesome. The uh, so I mean I guess we can't you know can't ignore the elephant in the room. And Andrew and I actually did a show on on Tuesday, kind of talking about Trev Alberts right as the news broke. But since you're a Husker fan and you're on the show, just to I feel like we can't kick the thing off without at least getting your reaction to, yeah. to, to the Trev Alberts news. Probably the biggest news. That, Kind of well, need some, your help this week too. Yeah, some of the more shocking news I've seen in the Husker well, Husker landscape in a long time. Would love your quick perspective before we dive into the nuts and bolts of your business. Well, yeah, you know, it it was shocking to me as well. I thought it was a uh, I thought it was a joke when I first heard it, and then <laughs> it you know it wasn't a joke, and I you know like everybody else held my breath and crossed my fingers until the the official word came out later in the evening, and then I was like, well, okay, here we are. Let's. Uh, you know, keep moving forward, but that sucks, man. That's a kick of the groin. There's no getting around it. Yeah. Yeah. It's been, it's been a weird, a weird week, a weird fallout. I think, um, I think we touched on it a bunch on, on, you know, Tuesday or Wednesday or whatever it was, I lose track of days, but, um, you know, I think for us, it's, it's, there's such a personal nature of it, of we've had Scott Frost, we've had Trev Alberts, like these guys that we loved watching when we grew up. And it's like, I think that hurts a little bit more. It hurts more than like Bill Moose or some of the other ones where you're like, oh, he wasn't like, like Trev was us, you know, and so yeah, I think that's, yeah. uh, it's personal. Well, yeah, exactly. And we expect since those guys are, we're part of the machine and are part of the machine that it should mean as much to them as it is to us. And right. when it doesn't and they leave and they go somewhere else, that's just, that's just an extra dagger. I mean, it's just, yeah. it's a twist of the knife, but yeah. you know, like I said, that's, that's the nature of college football. You know, I've, I've, I've been a part of this stuff for, for going on seven years now. And, it is an ever-changing landscape. It just is. You, you you just have to roll with the punches, and this is one more punch we're just going to have to roll with and keep moving forward. Totally. That's, well, that's, that's I, I think it's a great segue. So, I, you know, I, I've been reading a ton about your business. I've watched all the previous uh, Go Big Redcasts that you were on. Shout out to Honky and the Go Big Redcasts. They're, they're friends of the pod. Um, great interviews there. I love, uh, you know, Bartu is a big, I'm a huge fan of his on, on social media. Take us all the way back. So, I, you know, I think your business is fascinating. And we're going to dive deep on it. How did it start? Where did it start? Who started it? Um, and, and then, you know, we'll, we'll kind of ask some questions as to bring it back up to the present day. Okay, well, we, uh, we started about six or seven years ago with, with just a single client, you know, um, started from there. We wanted to keep, you know, David, Dave is my, is, is my partner, Dave Bartu, who you, you mentioned earlier. We wanted to keep our, uh, the firm kind of small and agile. That way we could, we could, we could, do what we wanted to do and, and not have this big, you know, vision that we had to kind of cast on the, all of our clients. We want to be able to change with our clients as their needs change. Cause we, we understand the nature of college football and, and how it is ever changing and, and, and quickly 
evolving. So we wanted to, we wanted to be able to roll with that as well. So it, we, we stayed small six years, seven years ago um, with one client, and it's it's just kind of grown organically, and just through word of mouth from administrator to, to administrator, um, we, we we we've grown, and we currently now have seventeen clients. Good for you. Uh, mostly in the Big Ten and SEC, but also uh, in every Power Five conference, including not also including the AAC and Conference USA. So yeah, but t- so that that I, I heard the story before, and I, I'd love for you to tell it again. That that first client you got, like, what was your your aha moment of like, hey, I actually I've got this talent because it started essentially. I mean, you're 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 a whiz, you're 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 a data whiz and analytics whiz. Like, what was the aha moment that's like, I know of something that can really help these athletic directors and coaches? Well, it, it was, you know, we, we, we were giving the athletic director, we were helping at the time we were giving him all this data and, and kind of helping him out with it. And he, he kind of made the comment of, I feel so empowered with this. You guys have empowered me to make a, a better decision and empowered me to make, you know, and that, at that point we're like, okay, wait a second. We just empowered this. And he, it, it's a big time athletic director. You know, our first one was, and he's since moved on to a couple of different jobs and he's at a really good place right now. And he's taken us with us everywhere he's went. And at the time we thought, okay, if we can make a guy like this, who's really smart, make him feel empowered with, 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 with what we're doing, then we have a niche that we need to really explore. And from there, it just has really taken off. That's amazing. And what, so what exactly is the model? Do you have a model Already you talk about it? Like, and we're, we're going to dive into it, but what's, tell us Don't worry about it, Dave. It's just the model. I mean, yeah. I mean, it's fantastic, but I, I want to learn. The model's the model. Yeah, the model's the model. I just right. yeah. use my dumb. I just use my dumb brain, and I just like spend a hundred hours a day on Twitter. But you actually like, <laughs> you actually like well, know stuff. Well, like what we do, and my my role in 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 matrix analytical. You know, Dave is the orator. Dave, if you, if you've ever heard Dave do an interview, the, the guy's entertaining. He he can yeah. he can talk his he can tell a story any way he wants to tell it. He's he's hilarious. I'm the guy that my, my role in this is, is to create, update, and maintain the data, the databases and the algorithms that we have, um, keep them accurate, keep them evolving so they are, they're, they're kind of staying ahead of, of you know, college football and the curve. Basically, what our model is and how we grade the coaches is it's purely based on performance of their unit they're responsible for. So, um, for example, uh, let's say we're, we're, we're looking at defensive back coaches, okay? Those defensive back coaches are graded on um, what has happened every single time a pass has went in the air against their defensive backs units. Um, what, what has been the outcome of that play? We take all those plays throughout his entire career of all those units he has, and that encompasses his grade. We also adjust it for the talent he has surrounding him and the talent he's, he's of his opposition. That way, you know, you, you have to have, you have to put everybody on, on a more level playing field that way. But, but, you know, uh, in the simplest form, that's 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 what it is. Is is what has your unit done? How has it progressed through the years? And, and what happens when your unit is is, is put under, under under the spotlight? Yeah, where, where do you where does that data come from? Is that huddle? Like you're tracking every play? Somehow you're pulling that from something or a variety of sources. Yeah, we 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 have a couple sites we scrape play by play data from, and okay. it is all put into a a large Excel spreadsheet file. You know. <laughs> Yeah, and then we have we have you know uh, code set up to just it it, run, it runs it for us. So it, it's 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 a lot of data. It's I, you, I've had to buy you guys built this. Computers. You built the code. You wrote the code. This is your own. Mm-hmm. That's yep. amazing. Hi, Terry. Wow. So yeah, go ahead, Andrew. What about the talent? So so I guess that if that's the denominator, are you are you guys grading talent as well, or or how do you figure that as the number? So no, Nebraska's talent we, versus iowa's or whatever <laughs> yeah we, we try to stay out of that realm um i mean there's only so many hours in the day and we don't have time to go through and watch film on you know <laughs> all yeah. the all the all the prospects and all the recruits coming up so well, we we rely we rely heavily on recruiting rankings throughout you know the, the, the top three services and those aren't perfect they're not right. perfect but they are you know that's the best way to quantify yeah. talent you know the best that we found anyway so that that's kind of what we lean on and to to, to, to actually find what the roster talent is uh of, of, of a unit and, and what they're going against week in week out okay okay what and so then, then oh no, you go ahead go ahead i'm going yeah, I'm I'm somebody, going I, have, I have so many questions question how no i guess you go first <laughs> so it, it's dave 
but I, I was a follower of her, his back when he even had a blog actually. And mainly cause I was looking for gambling tips and he would go, <laughs> he would go off of like, it was talent coaching and then, um, development, I think were like three location. Four. Yeah. TLC location, yeah. location coaching. TLC. Yeah. And that yeah. he would use that as a predictor of essentially which teams were going. Is that how you guys ended up linking up then on this or on this project? Um, well, really, Dave and I first started talking. Excuse me, started talking in 2014. Okay. And started talking because I had a, a model that was just as good as his, and I was predicting games and pre predicting outcomes and pretty actually predicting spreads. Excuse me, goodness. And um, he looked me up on, on Twitter, got a hold of me, sent me an email, and we we called and had a good conversation about you know about our our, our, our philosophies on things, and what we think almost identically alike. We, we you know, uh, he'll call me on, on something that that's happened in college football, and I'll say something, and it'll, it, he'll be saying it at, at the same time. I mean, he just we think a lot of alike in, in, in how to interpret data and how to. How, how to make you know the data tell story stories in the way that makes sense to people so that's um that's really how we kind of linked up then it initially was trying to trying to find out and predict the college football playoff rankings that was kind of the initial project we we, we did and we were able to crack that and do it and hmm. uh from there we, we we started talking about hey it'd be really cool if we if, if we get great coaches well i just happened to have a database i'd started back in college just for fun because i'm a nerd you know and, uh, <laughs> and I, yeah and and uh i i told dave about it and we're like okay how can we leverage this to, to actually you know help people with it and and, and that's kind of the, the genesis of this and and we got that one client and it's taken off from there you know it's it's just really really evolved every year and gotten better and and, and really spread it's amazing so that so talk me through like an engagement right so an athletic director comes to you and says, hey, we've you know, fired our coach. We've got a month, two months, three months to find our new guy. Um, what do you guys do? Are you like, here's the guy you should hire? Or do they have a list that they give you of guys that they want you to evaluate? Like, how does that engagement work? You know, typically um, they'll either, it's either people that we've worked with have, have told them about us and they'll, 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 they'll reach out to us. That's typically how it works. Um, and typically like, say we're working for an athletic director who's looking for a head coach. Okay. Um, or even, even a head coach who's looking for uh, a running backs coach, whatever, whatever the, the, the search is, is happens to be yeah. typically what happens in that, in that circumstance is they will give us a list of guys that they're interested in. They're the guys that they, that they feel are good, that they feel um, would, would be good fits. And what we'll do is we tier their their list for them and then add people to it that we believe would be good fits and are also great high in our system. Um, we our our goal is to our, our goal is is to raise the floor of everybody on their staff. Okay. Mm -hmm. we, we 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 mitigate hide the hiring risk that way they don't hire somebody that they're going to have to fire in, in, in a year or two and pay a massive buyout to we're trying to save mm -hmm. the universities from you know having to, to, to pay the co these coaches buyouts by by hiring the wrong person um so a lot of times we don't tell the client who to hire we don't give them a ranking we tier to their uh their 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 candidates that, that they that, that they give us using our, our our grading system and we add to it guys that we believe that they should go talk to and that's typically how it goes. Now okay. we have had situations where we had a SEC head coach actually call us and say, "Hey, I need a wide receiver coach. Who you got?" And that happens like that every once in a while, but not all the time. Um, and he went out and hired that that wide receiver coach and was very happy with him. So I mean, it it happens both ways. Yeah, and that's I mean, it's got to be an incredible asset, like you said, to the athletic director or to the departments to say, "Hey, we've got you know we have data that backs us up. This isn't just a gut feeling. This isn't just." A buddy this isn't just a friend this is you know backed by science essentially that's like yeah no this guy's good because of all of these reasons but what i guess what are you know what's the output that you're sending them is it okay we've ranked you on five criteria and he gets a 97 percent, or is it just like a like a tiering structure like you said like what's the are you handing them like a, a file or something 
Well, what we our deliverable is it, it's a PDF report on every candidate that they have, um, and what it, what it is is it's uh, it's it's that unit coach ranked in, in in terms of all other coaches at his unit since 2010 FCS and FBS. So, if say a, a running back coach is is a 71.6 percent in our grading scale, that means he's better than 71.6 percent of all other running back coaches since 2010, which is really good. So okay. um, that's kind of how we, we go about it. Now, we tier it because not every running back, not every coach is good at every, every university. For example, somebody who might be really good at UCLA is not going to be good at Ole Miss. Mm-hmm. Somebody who's maybe, who may be really good at Michigan wouldn't be really good at LSU. And it's just every program has different regional like and national capabilities that, are, that we have to try to stay consistent to. What's that? Like UCF and Nebraska. (laughs) Hypothetically speaking. Hypothetically speaking. Just an example. Hypothetically speaking, if someone were to try to go from Oregon to UCF to Nebraska, (laughs) that would would not work. Well, I mean, so this is – maybe we could just jump into that component of this is – so I love this stuff, like the head coaching search. Just, I mean, as Andrew knows, and probably a lot of our followers know, like I I love it. Like we've done it now, what, five times since we started us guys of like (laughs) – you know, we, and like, you know, flight tracker season is incredible. And you like, I rank the coaches in my brain and just like, what if we got this guy? But I, I guess what I'm, I always net out at, and I'm always fascinated with, and this is where I'd love your perspective is there are guys. And I think, cause one of your things is you, you look for guys that are progressing, they progress everywhere they go. Um, mm-hmm. And I think there's a lot of coaches like that, that, you know, as you look at the great coaches, Saban won everywhere he went, he won at Michigan state, mm-hmm. he won at LSU, he won at Alabama, like one everywhere he went check. Um, you know, Urban Meyer, he won everywhere he went. Um, I even put rule in that category. Hopefully he jumps off the page and he's like a guy that wins everywhere he goes. Great. Um, but there, there are so many anomalies to that, that I struggle with Frost being one of them of he won, he was winning everywhere he went. Um, there's tons of guys though. There's like Lane Kiffin has a really weird history. There's, you know, Willie Taggart's got a weird history. Like a lot of these guys that seem to have be on these upward, you know, upward pendulums, Hugh Freeze, like, I mean, you could list like a dozen of these guys that seem to be on an upward trajectory and then yeah. hit something and then they have five, you know, Jimbo Fisher. Jimbo. You, you, yeah. you know, he's a god at, at Florida State and he's horrible at AM. How does the your ranking rectify these guys who are on rocket ships, then crash, and then, you know, Gene Chizik, it's like, we're going to hire him again because he won in 2012 type thing. I mean, th- th- I just threw a million names at you, but um, how does how do you rectify that? Because you actually got the data behind it. Well, Willie Tiger is a great example. Let's talk about Mr. Willie Tiger. <laughs> um, so when you have the, the data laid out in front of you, like, like, like we do year by year by year, year by year, year, um, you can see trends. And one thing we have, Willie Tiger never should have been hired in a power five program. We had that, mm. we had that opinion when he went to Oregon, we had that opinion when he was forced, you know, we, we thought Florida state did Oregon a major you know, solid by taking him to, to Florida State. Um, Willie Taggart, his he did good at Western Kentucky, but it took him a long time to do that. It wasn't, you know, it was like a six-year project for him to, to build Western Kentucky up. Um, what we saw with Willie Taggart is the first year, or maybe even year or two, the his his recruiting was great, and 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 after that it just crashed, and mm-hmm. after that the program would just go in the hole. It, hmm. it, it, it did the same thing over and over. It was it was it was a very 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 obvious pattern. So what we would tell somebody who was asking about Willie Tiger is say, hey, this guy is going to come in with a lot of bluster. He's going to come in. He's going to shoot up the, the recruiting rankings the first year, maybe the first year and a half. But after that, when people you know get wind of a shtick, the program is going to crash. It's going to hmm. do it. it. It's 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 happened two or three times in his career. It's going to happen wherever you're at too. Wow. So. Um, when the data is laid out with you so unbiasedly, yeah, those 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 trends like that are really easy to see. Let's talk about you know Scott Frost for a second. Okay, one of the reasons that we we were actually um, in a, a, a recruiting search or, or not recruiting, but a, a head coach search for a, a client during that cycle that was looking at Scott Frost, and we actually told that client not to hire Scott Frost because. The program he took over at UCF, okay, he uh, 
he took over a, a program at UCF that was full of talent. They yeah. were they were a much more talented roster by far than anybody in his conference. Okay, and I know that team went zero and twelve the year before Scott got there, but that wasn't because of the players or the roster. That, that was because the team just basically quit on on, yeah. on on the previous coach. They were were done on George O'Leary. So they, mm-hmm. they they quit on him. Frost comes in. All he has to do is he's he had a twenty. I think it was, I believe it was a, it was a twenty six point or twenty six ranking advantage on every single team he played in AAC at the time. Hmm. That would be akin to. Oklahoma in the in, 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 in the Big 12 without Texas there. Wow. Um, that would be akin to, to Clemson, the ACC, before Florida State got good again. I mean, wow. he had so much more talent going for him than that he almost couldn't screw that up. Wow. He was not going to get that at most SEC programs or most Big Ten programs or anywhere else. He's not going to have that massive talent advantage to, 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 to wipe away all the, uh, all the mistakes that, that, that could be made by just inexperience. Mm-hmm. So we – we recommended that the, that the administration we were, we were helping at the time not hire him because we didn't believe he was ready yet for a job that they were going to hire him for. Was it our administration? <laughs> <laughs> well, no. <laughs> it's fine. We can talk about it. No one's there anymore. Everyone's gone. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, no, we're we're hypersensitive to not ruining any NDA, NDAs you've got. But the, I, I mean, it's it's, it's super interesting. Like. It's that, that's ridiculously interesting, and I would imagine, yeah, I mean, it makes sense. I think like a lot of that with him is is hindsight. Is I, I did go back and study that like crazy, and then you're like, I was looking at the Oregon teams, and I was like, how could this have happened? Um, he was so good at Oregon. Like, was he good at Oregon because of Chip Kelly? You know, was he good because he had you know phenomenal quarterback play? Maybe he didn't get those guys, and then UCF, like you said, they because they went, if I remember right, the year before I went twelve, they went like ten and two or something. So yeah, like, they, went, they, like, they went. They went to. They won the Orange Bowl the year before. Yeah, it was like ten and two, then zero and twelve, yeah. Yeah. and then he brought him back up. You still getting credit for winning. He did still win, but it was, yeah. you know, it was in Orlando and his UCF his lesser competition. Um, but that is, I mean, yeah. So your model picked up on it, um, which makes total sense. What I mean, I guess one of the other interesting components of it. That's maybe we can keep going on the coaching side because there, with how much movement there is in football, and these guys jump around, you know, so often. And you're trying to like, you're grading them on who they recruit, how they recruit, how they develop players. You know, there's again another a million examples of, um, I don't know, Adrian Martinez is the one that pops in my head of like, you know, he started in Nebraska and then he maybe developed a little bit more once he went to K State and then became a pro prospect, which he never would have been here. But how, how do you then rectify all these coaches that leave constantly, and then the players that they had recruited either getting better or worse uh, based on them being there or not being there? Well, that's one, of the, that's one of the most important things we track is, is progression and regression of units. So what happens the first year a coach both goes somewhere and arrives somewhere? What happens to the place he arrives to? Okay. Yeah. What, what is the immediate return on that unit that, he, that he's coming to? And what is the effect on that unit that he's leaving? If, 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 if the unit he, he's leaving either stays the same, is, is unaffected, or gets better, and the place he's going to is stays the same or whatever, then we know that coach – didn't really do much. He was it oh, wasn't wow. the coach, it was this, it was the players. If you know the the unit beforehand, you know that he that he, they came from, you know uh, has 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 a regression year, and the years and 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 the, and the, and the, um, the unit he goes to pr- progresses in the first year he's there. When that's that's what I like to see. We like to see a coach like that. that that's good progression. That means he's he's flipping rooms and he's making an impact. Yeah. Um, it's you know. So that's that's kind of how we and, and we actually have put, have put a percentage to that. We have a percentage labeled to every every coach. What is their year to year, year over year progression and regression um, uh, per, per unit per year? So that's that's something we really watch closely, and and that's a that's a number we underline and highlight for all of our clients when when, when they're going through these coaching searches. So, the here. you're on mute. Interview muted. There you Thanks. go. My daughter was present. just in the room. <laughs> yeah, she looked great. Tell Lucy hi. She's a, she's a numbers yep. nerd. Does she have a question? She to listen in. <laughs> <laughs> she, she raised her hand from the back row. Um, yeah. Um, Lucy was just wondering, so how far in does this go? Like to, to, to what 
level of assistant coach? I mean, can you go everything from grad assistant to athletic director by chance? Or uh, <laughs> I mean, like how hypothetically far, speaking, like what's, what's the scale? Well, we have helped with athletic director searches before. We have oh, okay, before. okay. Um, it's it's you're not, hired. We've only, it, we've only done it once. Do you do, does a school need to have a president? What's that? Does a school need to have a president? Because we have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would probably what? help, especially if there hasn't been one for seven months. That might. That okay. Might if there's no president, can you find us a, can you find us a president? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. The database doesn't go to that far. That level, okay. That yeah. Level. If no, if there's no chancellor and there's no president and there's no athletic director and there's no board of regents, I don't think your your data is going to do us any good. <laughs> well, there's nowhere to send the data. <laughs> <laughs> no one's even looking at it. It's unread. Anyway. Yeah. No, it's but yeah, the, I mean, you the answer your question, it goes the, the, level. The, 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 the level goes clear down to uh, just the, the the active eleven coaches is is okay. who we track. And we do that for all of FBS all the way down to F through FCS. So I think it's like two hundred and two hundred and sixty one teams, I think it is now. Hmm. So we, we we track all the movement, track all the data. It's a lot of data to track. So are there examples of recent hires that you um may or may not have been with well, you could blink twice if you were or something but if that you said okay this one was a slam dunk i knew this was going to work and then on the other end of the spectrum like i mean you mentioned willie taggart but say well, even more recently than him like in these last few hiring cycles someone where you said this is not going to work this is going to crash and burn yeah there's been both um i can't really go into names or programs or anything like that i don't want to get my hand slapped you know that's, oh. that's never fun but like um there's been a few and you know it's tough in those situations because you've you've provided so much data and, and put so much legwork in, into providing them and you can see it coming a lot of the times you're like okay no 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 it's one of those you cover your eyes you know but yeah it's hard not to get personally invested sometimes in, in, in these searches and be like okay this is who you should be hiring why didn't you do that why you know it was it was right there in the data it was it was as clear as clear as day you know yeah one good example is Jamie Chadwell should not be at Liberty right now still. Yeah. There's no way that guy should still be at Liberty. I don't care yeah. what type of offense he runs. I don't care if it's triple option. I don't care if if the guy wins ball games. He yeah. should be in power five. Like there's no reason he shouldn't be. And that's we've yeah. tried to push him forward a couple times and it's just been frustrating that he hasn't caught on anywhere yet. What's in it when you're in those rooms? And you're you're giving your output, and you're saying, "Hey, here's your ranking. Here's your guy." And you see the athletic director's eyes twinkle and say, "Like, I actually want number three on your list because he's charismatic, because he knows the South." Like, what what are they saying in the room? They're just like, "I, I just got a good feeling about him." Like, is, is it true? Exactly. Like, it's a good feeling versus your, that's what like it comes down to. Exactly that, or there's there's some boosters who are uh, very go. vocal yeah. and have a lot more, you know, monetary push than we do with our data does. Yeah. So uh, a lot of times it's that and it's politics and it's just wanting to, and also it's one of those things where maybe the, the tier of coaches that we were, are suggesting that they hire, those guys are too much of a risk for the athletic director to take. Every athletic director has, has a number of chips at his table, right? Mm -hmm. How many chips can he put in before he's, he's, you know, too, too tied to that coach and if that coach fails he's going to fail and get fired too yeah so if athletic director feels like he has enough basically chips in his pile that he can he can go in on a big risk then they're, they're more likely to take that but if he is on his third hire and he's just got us involved and wants help then he's more likely to go with the safe hire that all the big boosters want that way he can throw his hands up and say this is all this is who y'all wanted you know why you can't get yeah. mad at me for it you know yeah. so that comes Deep. into play as well and so one of the things you'd said on, I think you said on the, the Redcast, again, shout out Redcast uh, guys for asking good questions, but um, you, could, you you talked about how location matters, and maybe I think that's a key component of it. Of um, And the specific example I'd heard you use before is Mike Riley, which is near and dear to our hearts. Uh, yeah. <laughs> it was all fixed in. It's all fixed in. It's just... <laughs> we can just run, we just run through all of our failed hires, which is now up to a baker's dozen. Uh, but he was really strong in the, you know, on the West coast and then, you know, the, the Northwest. Um, and I think you specifically said like he, he wouldn't have been good at Florida state and clearly wasn't good at Nebraska either, but how, how exactly does that factor into your uh, equation of, you know, I, I mean, 
maybe DeBoer is a better one to um, to even look at. Of like, he's just found a ton of success in Washington. Is he going to have success in Alabama? Like, those are how dramatically different the Pac-12 is from the SEC and the Big Ten. Like, how do you factor in those big leaps that are needed to go from Big Ten to big, you know different conferences, different locations, different cities? Well, really, it, it depends on on the candidate himself. Has he? done it before has he been able to, to, to jump in a different region and hit the ground running and adapt to, to where he's at has he ever been outside the region he's currently in that's another big thing um de Boer, we we that that hire specifically for alabama we actually liked it because de Boer, coach de Boer has 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 went from you know indiana coaching it's indiana crazy. having success as offensive creator there um fresno state had success mm-hmm. there to washington had success there was a tremendous coach at Sioux Falls in, in Iowa, right? Or yeah, that, that's it. Yeah, is that, is that right? Yeah. Um, so he's done it in multiple regions and in, in multiple places and multiple levels. So we feel like he should be fine going from Washington to, to Alabama, be, doing do, taking the steps it's going to take to 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 familiarize himself with the region and what it's going to take to win the SEC. Um, you kind of contrast that with somebody like Brian Harson. Who went from Boise State to Auburn? Yeah, um, and it's you, you can kind of see the dichotomy there. It's Brian Harson is, is, is always, was always a West Coast guy, right? He he had he had a stint at Texas where he was the he was the offensive coordinator there, but it was a short stint before he came back when he was Boise State's head coach, right? Mm-hmm. He was Boise State's offensive coordinator. He's always been a Mountain West, you know, West Coast guy. Mm-hmm. Um, he I think he had a short stint at Arkansas State. Okay, um, but it was just hard to see him make that move from a place like Boise, where he was he was successful at Boise, but he wasn't lighting the world on fire like he was like Chris Peterson right. successful at Boise, right? Yeah, it was hard seeing him going from 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 somewhere like that to to uh, an environment like Auburn, where you need to know the Southeast, you need to know how to handle boosters and people who have lots of hands in the pie, you know? Um, yeah, and, and an example like was, that though. So would your would your model, um, or as you're presenting it, if like Auburn came to you and was like, we want to hire this guy, are you just like, it, it scores very negatively because he's never left the Mountain West and he's sort of always been up there? Or is it more just like, it's just such an un- unknown, guys? You know, is it a, is it like, are you like actually downgrading because of it? Or are you just like, he's never been, you know, he's never been to Alabama? <laughs> well, we don't actually, we don't actually downgrade their score. Um, but, but what we do is we, we, we will give them the report and just have a big red. We, we always have a list of red flags for every candidate. Okay. Yeah, okay. Um, and the big red flag there would be he's never been, you know, east of east of Grand Island, Nebraska. You know, <laughs> he's, yeah. you know, this, this, this guy is is what we would consider a good West Coast candidate and, and would have a hard time, we believe, assimilating into the SEC culture. That's what we would tell Auburn in that in, in that situation. Now, it, ultimately, ultimately, it's up to the administrator to take that advice or not to. He's the one right. getting paid millions of dollars to, to make these decisions, not us. We're just a three pieces of a thousand piece puzzle trying to make the picture clear for him. And that's that's our job. OK, give him the information, give him um, some clarity and let him make his decision. Wow. Yeah. What about. I mean, just because you said it. We got to go down the rabbit hole. How does one approach an AD search? I mean, that's got to be completely different. There's so many sports. There's so many moving parts. Yeah. I mean, it was it was interesting and it was fun, you know. Um, but it but basically what we did is is we start with the premise that okay, at any any athletic department, whether you want to admit it or not, ninety six percent, ninety seven percent of of the programs, the athletic programs in the country. The front porch is the, is the football program. Sure. If your football program is doing well, it's good for the rest of your athletic department, typically. Correct. Okay. So we want to make sure that front porch is good. So we want to look for athletic directors who have had success hiring football coaches, who have had success keeping their, their football programs on track. Um, and that's kind of what where we based it off of. And then we trickle down to the other sports. How have they mm-hmm. done with, with, with all the money-making sports, men's basketball, you know, um, um, volleyball in, in some instances, you know, uh, women's basketball, how have they done with all the other sports trickling down from, from, from football? And then how are, good are they with fundraising? How good are, are they with, with, with the capital gains projects and things like that? Um, 
that was kind of up on the list as well. Um, it was it was different, definitely a foray into some foreign territory for us, but we believe we put a good day together, a good list. And ultimately the, the, the program we helped hired one of the guys that we uh, had in our top tier for them. So it, it, it worked out well. Well, I mean, so what other criteria are you looking at? It's successful program. Is it fundraising? Is it hire? It's hiring of coaches. It's mm -hmm. like, it's, it is like the, what are the four to five things that you're looking at? So um, me and Andrew need to go hire a new athletic director. I think it's, I think it's on our shoulders. And then we also have, we've got 600 people now listening. And so the 600 people, if you guys want to throw your hand, your cat in the ring, we need. Yeah, they're all taking director. notes as well. We're just going to crowdfund <laughs> our next, uh, <laughs> we're crowdsourcing well, ideas. Well, what we, what we, our, our biggest things were, and things that were conveyed to us is we all, you know, cause we, we reached out to the, to the program and said, Hey, this is, um, we're, we're willing to help you with gather data for this, but what are some of your criteria? And some of the criteria they put forward for us was first and foremost, they wanted a, a strong football friendly athletic director. They wanted somebody who was able to, um, who knew the region, who, who, who knew, um, how to how to push forward big projects that was another big big thing for them and that was so that was some of our biggest criteria and that was kind of what we went on for, for them that seems crazy and, that you would you, you guys have the ability to flex up and down like that down to like you can create a wide receivers coach and also an athletic director <laughs> yeah buddy i was sweating on that one because like i said <laughs> The, 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 the model wasn't built to to, 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 to to go out and find athletic directors we were kind of working on the fly at that point in time, but it all worked out well in the yeah. end and we learned a lot from it. So I think we could do it again if asked. Wink, wink. So yeah, there you go. <laughs> in case, in case any of our board of regents are listening right now. Um, all right. Yeah. I, t t let's talk about development. Um, I think that's a pretty hot term in, in the Nebraska circles. And, um, you know, I, I think as we always look, and I think it's no secret, like we've always had a ton of talent. Uh, like mm -hmm. Nebraska has always had a high level of talent. It's seemingly, I mean, and Andrew obsesses over the, the recruiting rankings. Like we seemingly always had the most talent in the West of the big mm -hmm. time, which is, you know, obviously going to be a dated term as of like six months from now, but we have seemingly have the most talent and like underperform to that talent um, each year. I, I guess talk about that concept of like coaches that are, are recruiting well, underdeveloping talent. And then I think about, you know, a program like Wisconsin, or at least the, the Wisconsin of old, they used to just recruit a bunch of two and three stars and develop the heck out of them and turn them into NFL prospects. Um, how, you know, how does that kind of pop in your, in your rankings? Well, it's, it's maddening if you're a fan of somewhere like Nebraska, right? Where, you know, yeah. especially somebody who, who sees all the data and is like, okay, this, this shouldn't be happening this way. Like this mm -hmm. many years in a row, it shouldn't be happening like this. Right. Um, but yeah, that, that shows you, we, we grade entire coaching staffs as well. And those staffs you're mentioning, Iowa, Wisconsin, um, some of these staffs, Kansas State for years, um, they Iowa State uh, to, up, up until the last few years, right? Um, their coaching staffs graded really high as a group because of their ability to take you know players and and have them play up a different level and basically we we, we call it punching above their 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 their, their, their weight class. They have their rosters punching above their weight class. Um, yeah. They're continually taking guys that. That maybe were passed over by um, some some bigger programs and putting them in the NFL and then putting them in, putting them not only in the NFL but in, in, in situations to to make an impact in the NFL. Yeah. Um, we look at all that. We grade all that. And like I said, Iowa. Uh, as much as it pains me to say it, because I, I like I Just said, don't I'm, say it. yeah, don't, it's, yeah it's, we're gonna bleep it out. We're gonna bleep it out. Yeah. <laughs> it's a different example. There's there's staff. <laughs> They, they've had a top 15 staff overall in the country for uh, the past five years. And, and that's even with a, that's even with the offensive struggles calculated in. That's it's without an offensive coordinator. Wait, wait a sec. Like a third of the staff is top 15. Right? <laughs> <laughs> Ryan Ferris yeah. has got to be bottom one. No, oh, yeah, no, that's that's with the anchor that was Brian Ferris. Oh, he, I mean, he so he ranks high as like an offensive line coach, but like, Yes. He's got to be, he's like high offensive line coach. And then yeah. like the worst offensive coordinator in the history of college football, which yeah. has, yeah, has to be connected in there somewhere. He was, we, we like, we like to call it bottom quartile. That, that's, that's bottom quartile. Okay. <laughs> the politically <laughs> correct version that's of not he's not really not good is bottom quartile. <laughs> yeah. So, but, that, I, so then, okay. So you find, I guess that's what's interesting about those staffs then. 
And I, I guess you attribute some of that success to the overall staff itself or to like a really strong offensive line coach or wide receivers coach. Like as you're looking at that data and people are coming in and they're saying, Hey, I want to hire, you know, uh, whether it's an offensive coordinator or an offensive line coach or whatever it is, are you like, Hey, there's this guy in Wisconsin who every single year has outperformed. Like, I guess, how much do you attribute to the actual wide receivers coach, offensive line coach versus um, the program and just being able to develop it? Well, see, that's and that would that would that's one of those things that we would have to mention and say we really like this offensive line coach, but he's been at one place under the same head coach his entire career. So we like what he's done while he's been there, but we don't know what he's out like outside that sterile environment of, let's say, Wisconsin, okay, or Iowa. Yeah. We don't know what he's like outside of that. We, you know, we don't know what he's like outside that culture. That's something you're going to have to determine in your interview as an administrator. But here's what the numbers say about what he's done there. And we think that he could probably do the same thing um, 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 where you're where, where you're asking him to go. Um, that's always one of those things that has to be, uh, you know, up to the administrator after the interview to kind of pick the person's brain apart and, and and see what's 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 really you know going on there. Typically, that typically that really hasn't shown to be a trend where if a guy is good one place, he isn't somewhere else. No matter you know if he's if he's been two places or three places or not, it, if if the offensive line coach has been really really good at North Dakota State, for example, for years and years and years and years, he's he's likely to go somewhere else and, and have success. I mean, because yeah. he's learned something at North Dakota State. There's a reason he's been good at North Dakota State for for years and years and years and years. He's learned yeah. something. He's 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 uh, you know he, he's got a method to his madness that he's able that's that's that that will travel with him. So that typically isn't a big deal, but we do we do often will um, um, highlight that to, to our clients and say, hey, you know, just beware. He's never been anywhere else. We don't know what he's going to do outside that environment. Cool. Can we? Are we allowed? You know, you tell me if we can or can't. Can we talk about Nebraska's coaches just at that like a high level? In your thoughts, is that allowed? Um, high level. Like, can I ask you if I if I mention a name, Marcus Satterfield, are you allowed to be like just thumbs up, comments. thumbs down? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like gladiators. Like, <laughs> All right, we're out. We're yeah, out. We can't talk about head coaches. Marcus, Marcus, he's um, what I really like about like, like about Marcus Satterfield is, is is he's he's been with 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 Coach Rule all through his all th- you know all through his career. They 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 have they they speak the same language, right? And that's one one more thing that's 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 very important to coaching staffs is is the is is the ability to communicate. Okay, um, any any completion of any large project or any, any, any large goal has to have has to be rooted in, in communication if there's a breakdown of communication there anywhere in that line it makes it hard to achieve a, a goal which is hard you know like 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 winning a, a, a conference title in, 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 in today's college football landscape that's hard to do in order to do that you have to have good communication that's one thing i do like about nebraska staff is is they all are on the same page they all have the same goal yeah. and they all agree on a way to get there and, and, and achieve that goal I like it. Uh, yeah, I think that. Oh, go ahead, Andrew. Yeah, well, I was just gonna say, and and this isn't related to Satterfield, but it kind of is. Do you have criteria when someone should be fired? <laughs> Jesus, <laughs> we stay out of those. No, lines. I'm just like, is there a is there a follow up? Like, let's say two, three years down the line, like there's been a hire. It's like, is there a tipping point when you say this is no longer working to a you know past client or something like that? We we stay out of those talks, but we what we do do is we do send a report card, a staff report card every year, updating on uh, okay what where what are the numbers and every, every one of those staff members, hmm. and along with that we 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 we, we are also um, attached to that uh, a salary that he should be making with that uh, with with that rating, at his rating what are other coaches of his rating making throughout college football. Oh, um, yeah paying him are you under underpaying him what does that look what does that look like um what percentage of the overall pool should he be making um with hmm. his responsibilities and, and with his performance output we do do those things for our clients now whether they take that advice or not that's totally up to them like i said we're just a few pieces of the yeah. puzzle trying to give clarity so right okay so i'm gonna ask you a question and I'm gonna, but i'm gonna intentionally make it more vague so that i don't get you in trouble the so the marcus satterfield example because i think about these examples a lot right dramatically different when he has Spencer Rattler versus Harburg versus now Dylan Rayola, 
And then I think about even across the country, when Lane Kiffin gets his guy, he's a dramatically different coach having, you know, one of the top quarterbacks in the country versus not, or, you know, any, any coach out there that has a premier talent, uh, quarterback in particular, like once they get their guy, you know, it obviously takes off. Once you get your Heisman guy, um, it takes off. How, I guess, how does that factor in of like, okay, this is him without his guy. And then this is him when he has Baker Mayfield, you know, like Lincoln Riley with his guys first, not type thing. How, like, how does that kind of, how do you balance that? Well, in our, in, and we, you know, that's, that is a good, that is a good question. But how, how we typically look at coaching grades is that we, we don't create, we don't consider a coach's grade uh, a solid until after four years of data has, okay. has been collected on him. That way it gives it time for he's, he's coached more than one quarterback typically in that time, typically. Um, or he's, if he has, he started with a freshman and, and, and went all the way through to, you know, four years with, with, with the same guy. And that's impressive in itself. But, um, uh, after four years, we consider the grade pretty solid and you typically from year four on to whenever the coach retires, he doesn't fluctuate too much from that grade year to year. Well, it's, time out. You're talking about four years period. So like if he's coached four years anywhere, once you have that, you feel pretty strongly about his. Yeah, about his correlation year on after that. It's wow. clear that a coach breaks on too far above that or goes too far below that. A couple uh, – one outlier of that that you mentioned earlier is Lane Kiffin. You know, he – early on in his career, he wasn't a guy we would have recommended to many programs. Mm-hmm. Um, but something happened with Lane, and he did something that very few coaches are able to do. He changed. He changed his philosophy, yeah. changed the way he did things. And now he he's one of the premier guys in the country. I think he's the top fifteen, top twenty head coach right now. Hmm. So I think that, uh, there's so many of those. There's like Sarkeesians out there where you're like, this guy's a total bust, and now he's in the playoff. And like, there's I feel like there's so many weird these guys having volatile careers that they make it really hard for like me to be like, wait, that guy you know won a title, then disappeared for a long time, and then he went to you know he went to the Nick Saban school of of therapy, and like he came out and. Now he's in a playoff. Coaching yeah. rehab. Yeah. yeah, it's like now, the coaching Nick, rehab that he sends him through. Yeah, uh, Sarkeesian's a little different. Okay, let's that, that's a good example. Let's, let's compare Sarkeesian and, and, and Lane Kiffin. Okay, Sarkeesian, you know, he was he was all right at USC. He didn't set the world on fire. Okay, he went to Washington. He did a good job getting them back to not a doormat anymore. Okay, right. He did a good job bringing talent there, but he didn't really get them to the point that Chris Peterson got them after after he left. Sarkeesian, we have him in our in our database as an average coach. He's average. Okay, mm-hmm. what he does, what he is good at, and what he excels at is he is a very good he he's he's very good at hiring staff here, hiring a staff. He's oh. got a tremendous staff there at Texas. He's yeah. got one of the best offensive coordinator, defensive coordinator, special teams coordinator combinations in the entire SEC. Okay, he himself calls plays for the offense. He's an excellent call, play, play caller. He's got Pete Kwiatkowski at a D, uh, as a defensive coordinator, who's one of the mm-hmm. best defensive coordinators that nobody knows about in the entire country. Yeah, um, special teams coordinator Jeff Banks is, is 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 very good at what he does. Has doesn't have very many down years as, as uh, a special teams coordinator. And then his position coaches he hires as well are are also all well talented guys. He his. He has surrounded himself with so much talent on that staff that it's hard for him to fail as a head coach at a place like Texas with, with as much talent as they have. Now, Lane Kiffin, on the other hand, he went from, you know, Tennessee, USC to, to I believe that his next stop was FAU. Okay. So yeah. he went down the level of the G5 and then he came up to, to Ole Miss, who isn't Texas in, in, in terms of the SEC. They're, they're more of, Texas Tech in terms of the big the Big Twelve, right? So mm-hmm. he is able he's he's been able to take Ole Miss and elevate that program to the point where they're a top twenty team every year. That's that's the difference in okay, who's the better coach there, Sarkeesian or Lane Giffen? We would say Lane Giffen is the much better coach than Steve Sarkeesian. Super interesting. Is let me ask you this, Sam. Is is watching football with you on a Saturday just like absolute mayhem? Like is your wife just like throwing pillows at you the entire time? Or are you just- <laughs> So that's funny because I, you know, I have two kids, a 10 year old and a seven year old. Right. And, uh, you know, I grew up from the time I was about eight years old, my dad and I, and Beatrice, 
from the time I was eight until I graduated high school, basically, every Saturday was we would get up and watch college game day on Saturdays, and we would watch football all day long until the whack double header got over at two in the morning with, with Hawaii. Right? There's nothing wrong That's with that. That's what we did. The best. Every Saturday we did that. That was that was normal. That was a normal Saturday. And so I kind of do that same thing with my kids, and I've done that since I've been married. And my wife. Yeah, it's less acceptable now. <laughs> He just, I don't get he it. just tolerates it. Yeah. You know, it's yeah. just like, but, but it's just, I, you watch too much football. But you watch, you watch the game, but you're just sitting there like, told, told those guys not to hire him. Do you watch like a defensive, you watch a defensive breakdown in the Boise State game and you're like, I told him not to hire that defensive backs coach. That's why. Like, <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that's exactly it. Now, you know, now I don't want to confuse it. We're not X's and O's guys at all. We're, we're data nerds and we, we, we have all the, all the all the data but you know there's there's still a part of you that that that, that watches and goes man if they just would have done this instead of doing that <laughs> this this this, this would have been, or how fun would it would have been if this offensive coordinator would have had this talent instead of yeah. not hiring him you know? that's amazing yeah that's, i mean that, that's that's a dream though the dream is to have like your you know to have your entire life be um be around football i, I always <laughs> i joke this is i'll give you my quick aside because you know, anytime people ask you, like, what do you want your like career to be? And like my career, my like the epitome to me of like life, if I had like unlimited money, is Phil Knight in Oregon has he <laughs> he's got a headset on in the booth and like he hears the plays. That to me is like the greatest. Yeah. That's it is like the greatest, the epitome of like rich guy wealth is like because NIL. Yeah, he's just like he's in there. The yeah, that's what, that's what I want. I that's just want to be in the ask. booth. I just want to have a headset that's like, yeah, 34, 34 traps coming, guys. You know, and just I could just be that oh guy. But you're living it, man. You're in it. You're like, you're like the, you've got your fingers like you're the puppet master of college football. <laughs> it's, it's fun, man. It's it's surreal at times. It really is because I I grew up, at, you know, like I said, at, as a kid, I didn't get into Star Wars a whole lot. I didn't get into any, Coaches, college coaches, and the whole college football scene was my universe, was my Star Wars universe. So hmm. those guys were were characters to me growing up. You know, the the, the Bill Snyders and the, and the and the Dan McCartneys and the, you know, those guys were were characters in, in, in my entertainment realm, right? So I grew up watching all that, and then being able to do this with with uh, with Dave and and, and do, to do what we do with our clients is, is just been it's it's really surreal at times, and, and I, I couldn't be more blessed and, and happy for to be able to do it. All right. So we're in that. This is, this is, we're part of it. This is like the circle of pain and we just had a tough week, but we're just going to keep going. But uh, cause I find this fascinating. If you're, if you were around for Nebraska's previous coaches doing this type of work, you weren't right. Like, can I ask freely about and plug your ears, put your headphones on <laughs> Bill Callahan. Oh God. <laughs> like was your model who just exploded at this NFL guy coming. Um, I mean, the, there's Callahan. There's like Pelini, I think, was popping off the page and was a defensive coordinator at LSU and a national champ. And that one, but like, would you have exploded at Callahan coming in and just like, wait, wait, like West Coast, this, you know, none of this like makes sense. NFL guy. Yeah. That was, you know, that would, yeah. I don't know what I would have done. I, I probably just would have went into hiding for a while and <laughs> just tried to ignore it. La 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 la, this isn't happening, you know. But no, that was you can't have a, a, a regime switch like that, a total philosophy switch like that without having some collateral damage. And there was a lot of collateral damage because of that, obviously. Oh, uh, yeah, so, look at us. God. Yeah, we're still wandering around in the desert. Thank gosh we have Coach Rule, but man, yeah, it's taken a long time to get here. But that, I mean, so that's because everything you've been saying has been like, okay, you need to find a guy that's been progressing nicely, that knows the region that knows the school that knows the university that grades really well, that has good recruiting that has good development. And like, to me, he broke all of those things. And honestly, like Riley broke a lot of those things too. Cause I was you know, it's just a West coast thing. Um, I don't know. It's just, it's very interesting to hear you talk. And then I'm thinking back of all of our coaches of like, God, if you had only been there, <laughs> maybe you were, I don't know. I'm not going to say, you were, but like Callie to me was like, that one, that one breaks every possible thing to go from like, you know, obviously an option run, you know, hard nosed yeah. football to like the West Coast thing. Well, well, Riley wasn't much of a better fit at the time either. I mean, he was he was 
he was riding off of the sunset of retirement at the time. His best days were way well behind him. He'd had many, yeah. many years of regression before we hired him. And he was not familiar at all with, with the landscape. I mean, that was such a yeah. left field. I mean, great guy. I'm sure, great, I'm sure he was a great guy, but man, that was just, yeah, just I was doubting that. Yeah. He just was never, he, he was, he had no business in Lincoln. He just didn't. How you know, that's, you, like, let's, how do you let's contrast that to, let's contrast that to coach rule for a second. You know, coach rule, he's, he's a builder. He, yeah. he's, he, he's, he, he's a culture yeah. setter. He has been his entire career. And as Nebraska fans, we've all heard that, right. But the numbers back that up as, as well. He's, He's in his career as a head coach. He's had an annual progression of eleven and a half percent a year. Eleven and a half percent a year. We, really typically good. At, we typically look at a head coach that has a progression over five percent to be good. His is eleven and a half percent. It's better than S&P five hundred. What? He's got the highest go. progression grade of any head coach in our entire data, database. So the future Shut is up. bright. That's real. No, yeah, for real, he does. He's the highest progressing of any head coach in our database with at least four years of experience. He has the highest progression rate year over year of anybody. So this is what he does. He I think we're back. Are we back? Are we back? Just made my oh, you're back. I think we're back. Are we back or are we back? <laughs> I, think, I thought we died this week. I thought we died this week, but I think we're back. We went from rock little, bottom. But we're back now. We went from rock bottom to all the way back. A little. We're right back in it. <laughs> we don't need any senior leadership. I agree. I think he's, I think he's a heck of a hire. I think like everything you're saying, like pops, like he's, you know, he's got that three or four year trajectory everywhere he's gone. Does it, I mean, do you just kind of write off the Panthers as like just an NFL thing didn't work? Is that, is it Saban? Yeah. Like, I mean, Saban couldn't do it. You know, Spurrier can do it. All these guys like failed in the NFL. Is that sort of just a, you just kind of write it off? Those two games, the NFL, the NFL and, and college football are two completely different animals. We, we don't have any correlation between the two at all. Like we 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 will, uh, we will uh, if a coach comes from FCS to FBS, we will use his coaching data from the FCS and bring it up. We won't use NFL data and bring it down. It's just such a different ball game, such a different atmosphere, so many different factors playing into it. It's 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 not even the same game as far as coaching is concerned. Right. Um, yeah. So no, none of that really factors into what we look for in college. So let me we're getting close to. Hang on, Andrew. I'm going to ask a couple. We'll, let's, let's finish at the top. We'll finish at an even hour. Um, and then we'll go offline. Well, then, well, then we'll, go off, we'll go offline, and Adam can tell us all like, the actual secrets offline. <laughs> the, so, two, two like massive trends one, one nerdier, but also it's so two major trends. I'm curious how they're impacting you or your business. One, NIL is dramatically impacting you know, all of college football. I'm curious how that impacts it. And then also, the explosion of AI, like how has that impacted your models, if at all? Has that made it better or worse? Uh, would love like your perspective on both of those. Um, NIL, yeah, absolutely. It's it's going to it makes us more critical for a university to use somebody like us to help them with their coaching hires. That way, they're not wasting millions of dollars on buyouts when they have to fire coaches. You take that money and use it for something more. Um, put put it to better use, like NIL. Okay. Don't put it to, to, to having to buy out coaches you made mistakes on, on hiring. Um, AI, um, yeah, that's that's something that we're currently tinkering with and seeing how we can how can we, we can implement that better and, and use it to to make our, our database even even more accurate and even more um, um, cutting edge. But yeah, that's definitely something I see in the future that could that could play a part. Love it, All right, Andrew. Last your final question. Let's wrap this thing up. Well, if it's the final question, um, how many games are we winning this year? Ooh, there we go. Eight. Ooh, ooh. Eight. We're back. I, go go eight. I can work with eight. I'll take Let's eight. Go eight. I mean, I'm, I think I'm closer to ten, but I also have like let myself down for the last fifteen years. So I'll take eight. I will <laughs> gladly take eight. I'll gladly take eight, especially if the data says eight. That's fantastic. <laughs> uh, awesome. There's. 700 plus people on here. Thanks everybody for joining and listening. This is fantastic. This is the Husk Guys podcast. Adam, uh, everybody check him out. Call it at CFB Professor on Twitter. Uh, check out Matrix Analytical. The website's super cool. Great guy. Thank you for joining us, Adam. It's been a pleasure. It's been a treat. And I uh, appreciate you joining us. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it. I appreciate it. This, is, this, is, this has been great. No All right, guys. I'll end it there. <laughs>